So this is Rod I Her Elf. John Dye Harrell, our guest speaker for today. Um, he was previously incarcerated uh, for 25 years, and upon release, he formed a reentry. Um, it's called the Center for Returning Citizens. Um, and it's a really great reentry program, very grassroots, very holistic approach. Um, and so today, he's going to talk about his experience inside as well as his experience outside. I'm also going to talk about mass incarceration because mass incarceration, um, I'm sure you... All right. So if this class is prisons in America, then mass incarceration is what you're looking at. By way of background, as she said, my name is John Daharrell. I'm the executive director of the Center for Return Citizens. Now, what people call that a reentry program because we deal with people coming out of prison. We don't call it reentry because reentry has become a hustle. Now there's all kinds of organizations, there's all kinds of agencies. In fact, the former governor of New Jersey just owned an agency called New Jersey Reentry, and they're doing reentry. And there's a lot of money flowing in that direction for people to help people to come out of prison to transition. We call TCRC a system of accountability and we're about transformation and transition. Because ideally, if you're going to transition, that should begin while you're incarcerated. So many times we have guys who walk through our doors and they have been down 5, 10, 15 years, and you come to us without a GED and no life plan at all. And what that means when I see that is that they have basically wasted a lot of their time while they were incarcerated. And you can waste time while you're incarcerated in a lot of different ways. In the weight room, in the basketball court, chess playing, you know, some guys play cards, some do a lot of reading, but not reading that is going to benefit themselves. You know, a lot of my friends and associates read a lot of urban novels. You know, some of them got smart and started to write urban novels. But if you're reading for pleasure instead of knowledge, then you are not uplifting your worldview. And ideally what prison can be is a place where for the first time in your life you slow down and you take a look at your life. My last sentence, and I did two sentences, my first sentence was in my mid-twenties, and I did seven and a half on 15 years. But I didn't really learn that much. I was focused on getting through the bit, getting back to my family, getting back to the world, and I did whatever was necessary to get me through that. And I went to the pro board, I worked every day in the factory, you know, sent more money to my family, went to the pro board, impress them, enough of them to let me go. But inside, I was still the same person because I hadn't really worked on myself. I was still a hustler, I was still a gangster, and the streets were still calling me. And we were serious gangsters. We weren't BT, that bullshit gangster, right? We were gangsters who would blow you up, take you out in the woods, bury you, and nobody see you anymore. And that's the kind of lifestyle we lived because that's how we grew up, and that's how we were. My second bit, because I hadn't read enough inside and I hadn't been to the law library and followed the laws. When I came home, I started making money again, it was rolling, and I was robbing a lot of banks. That's been a thing in my life that I did for a lot. I mean, I was a very good bank robber, I robbed a lot of banks. There's something about going in the bank, getting that money, coming out. It's exhilarating, stimulating, and very lucrative back in the day. Now it's a dying thing. Unless you're riding armored cars or unless you are a very computer literate and you're doing it electronically. But back in the day, bank robbery, armored cars, 
supermarket robberies, all those things were the things that we did to move forward. And then we took our money and we did things in the community. Because I always had a conscience, even as a criminal, and I was a gangster and a criminal, we still looked at our community as the foundation of what we were doing. So for example, we would never do a home invasion. When I was young, a home invasion wasn't done by true gangsters. Because if I was having a beef with you, I'm not gonna shoot you around your mother or your wife or your kids. I'm never gonna come into your home because that's your sanctuary. Nowadays, it's a whole different vibration and you read about home invasions, you read about kids getting killed on the street because guys can't shoot straight because they shoot like this, which is bullshit. It's some Hollywood shit. In our neighborhood, and I live on um, 15th Street, right above Broad and Erie. About two weeks ago, we have a, our office and a after school drop-in center. So we were in the we drop-in center, and the kids were out front, and I had a long day. I was in the back office, you know, kicked back in the chair, with my feet up on the desk, getting a little nod because I was tired. So I hear four gunshots. So I get up, and I go to the door, and I look out the door. And I see a guy running down this way. But I don't see anybody this way, and there's nobody shooting at us. So I go back and, and go back to sleep. There's nobody shooting at us. So about maybe 10 minutes later, we get a knock on the back door, and the police is there, and they say, there's a car outside here with the window shot out. It belonged to one of you guys. And it belonged to the director of our after school program. So we went outside, you know, look at the car, the back window's all shot out. So she's from Jersey, you know, she's kind of hyped, you know, because she ain't really with that. And while they're talking, there's some more gunshots down the corner of Butler Street. Somebody got shot and they're dead in the car. But the reason we weren't that concerned with it, because no one was shooting at us. Because we hadn't done anything to get shot at. Usually when you see on the news, or when you see you know, somebody killed or murdered, it's for a reason. And our neighborhood is for something like, you took a package, and you beat the dude for the money. Or you said you are going to do something, and you didn't do it. Or you disrespected somebody to a level where he feels like he has to take your life. But many times that level of engagement has no thought process behind it. Because if I say something to your girl, and you don't like it, there's ways for it to handle it. But if you say, I'm going to knock him, I'm going to knock him off, what you are doing is effectively ending someone else's life, but ending your own life too. So many times when we go into court, because we do a lot of, of um, work with guys who are going into court, we do many different things. We do the re-entry part of people coming out, but we also try to do the pre-entry part to keep people from coming in. So we go around, we do a lot of seminars, we do a lot of workshops, we talk to a lot of young people in our neighborhood who are on the path that we led. Most of the brothers who work for my organization have done serious time. Mikhail, who's one of my main guys, we started out together in a cell. I did 18, he did 20, and I came home, he came home, and we linked back up, and now we're doing this work. Anthony did 10 years in grade. Um, Emmanuel did 23 in effect. Most of the people who are the core of my organizations, we are all returning citizens. We have all spent a major part of our lives behind the wall. So we intimately know that lifestyle. So for us to be able to impact people coming home is very easy. Because there are very few things that you're going to experience in your transition that we have not experienced personally. And many times it's the small things that hang people up. You come home and you love your girl. And she's a beautiful girl, you know, while you're gone, you, know, you try to stay in contact with her. But now you're home and she's seeing him. She don't love you no more. But you got kids, so you still gotta deal with those kids. But you're not trying to deal with the reality that while you were gone, 
this dude who you hate because he got your girl also took care of your kids. You got to look at the reality of life's situations. And many times things happen that embitter people coming home. I came home after 18 years of incarceration this last bit. I had a 20-year sentence. I did 18 straight. And the entire world had changed. My parents had gotten old. My kids had grown up. My grandkids are now coming up. And even though I took extraordinary efforts to stay in their life, I actually taught parenting classes while I was inside. And in those parenting classes, the first thing I would say on the first day of the class is it is impossible to be a good father from behind bars. Why would I say that? Why? What is a good father? Give me a definition. What's a good father? A good father is someone who takes care of the kids and provide for their family. Okay, that's one thing. Someone else. What does a father do? You have fathers? They supervise. Supervise what else? Teach. Teach. Protect. Most definitely protect. We're going to come back to that. What else? Show affection. Show affection. What does a father do for a son? God. Teach him to be what? Yeah. Man. What does he do for a daughter? Teach her how man should treat her. Yes. That's extremely important. So many young women who are without fathers get treated any kind of way because they are not used to a father's love. A father teaches a young woman that she has value, that she's beautiful, that she should be treasured, that whoever you love needs to love you as much as I do. And if he doesn't, put his ass in the wind. <laughs> and that's the reality of it. That's what a father does. So it's impossible to be a real father from behind bars on the level that you need to grow up as a whole person. So what I would teach guys how to do, and what I try to practice myself, is how to do as much as you can, given the limitations that you are laboring under. I would have to father in 15-minute phone calls, and countless letters. And I wrote so many letters, I mean, it was, it was crazy. When I came home, my kids literally had boxes of letters and cards and things that I had sent. 